It is a brutal and horrifying discovery. Well, instantly we knew we definitely had a homicide on our hands. A male savagely severed arm discarded in a Calgary dumpster. You are starting with a huge puzzle and you're trying to find the answer. Whose limb was this? And what kind of monster could commit such a gruesome and terrifying crime? This was a true whodunit. Everybody was a suspect at that point. This is the story of a mother's desperate search for answers. You just think, oh my god, so where's the rest of his body? And investigators dogged determination to unearth the truth. It's my job, my responsibility, to bring someone to justice who's responsible for this uh, horrific crime. of January 18th, 2008, in a quiet neighborhood in Calgary, Canada. A homeless man collecting bottles for cash is searching through a residential dumpster when he makes a sickening discovery. Inside a garbage bag is what appears to be a dismembered right arm. That's when nearby resident John Edwards is called to the front door. And the homeless guy says, quick, quick, you have to come look, look in the dumpster. So we went back to the dumpster, kind of opened up the, the top of the bag. Inside was a human arm, um, cut from approximately the collarbone, just right across there. Edwards makes a frantic call to 911. Police emergency. Oh, hi there. I believe there's part of a body in a garbage bag in the dumpster, like a complete arm with like blood on it and stuff. An arm? I don't think they actually believed me when I when I said that there was, you know, a human arm in the dumpster. I think they might have thought it was a bit of a crank call. Get him here quick. That's the one right away, right? Oh, they'll be there very quickly, yes. Yeah. Investigator Cliff O'Brien heads to the location. Initially, I thought there's no way that this is uh, a legit, it's going to be a mannequin or it's going to be something that, uh, that just isn't a real body. Patrol officers had already secured the scene when O'Brien arrives. And uh, sure enough, it was, uh, there was a human arm. Um, and they had some tattoos all the way from the wrist, you know, right, right the way up to the, the top of the arm. So, you know, your first inclination is something to do with drugs or, or bikers or something like that. The forensic specialist called to the scene is Jolaine Anderson. It's my job as a, a sergeant in the forensic unit to gather what is left at the scene from the offender and paint that picture uh, for the homicide investigators. And the picture is a shocking one. Instantly we knew we definitely had a homicide on our, uh, on our hands. And the first thing on my mind was that we need to identify this individual as a starting point. While police comb through other containers within a five-block radius, Anderson has the dumpster containing the arm transported to the forensic unit to be searched. It's not a very glamorous job because uh, one of my uh, team had to suit up and go inside the dumpster. If you can imagine, we have to go through every bit. That's when they make another grisly discovery. In the, uh, corner of the dumpster, we found a similar type of garbage bag uh, that we found the original arm in. In the uh, garbage bag, we found the second or the left arm. Certainly when there's a second arm, now I'm concerned that is this, this from the same person? Because there is that possibility that we have multiple victims here. It would have been a, a very violent struggle. Some of the fingers were almost severed. Anderson takes prints from what's left. Fingerprints are infallible. DNA is awesome. Uh, however, fingerprints are still uh, what we do and what we call our bread and butter still. Police submit both sets of prints to APHIS, 
the Automatic Fingerprint Identification Service. While they wait for results, O'Brien turns his attention to the tattoos on the dismembered arms. I contacted our major crime analyst, Trish Pace, and I asked Trish to uh, check our records um, for any tattoos that uh, might match what I'm seeing on these arms. We log tattoos, where they are, descriptions of them, so I'm able to search that. He gave me a description of the tattoos, and he said that there was some Gaelic lettering, um, some skulls, etc. So he had me looking through our databases. While the tattoos don't reveal the victim's identity, the fingerprints do. Both arms are from the same person, 22-year-old Chad Largy. To hear that one of your, your, your children is gone, and all they, could, all they found was his arms, you just think, oh my god. So where's the rest of his body? When a dismembered arm is reportedly found in a Calgary dumpster, lead forensic investigator Jolene Anderson is called to the location. What we did was entered forensically as to not disturb the scene just in case it was a homicide. When police discover a second arm, they fear they may have more than one victim on their hands. We have a very horrific crime. We have body parts turning up in our city. Fingerprints reveal that both limbs are from 22-year-old Chad Largy. While investigators will soon be under tremendous pressure to find the monster who committed the murder. What we need to do now is go out and unfortunately do the next of kid notification to Chad's mom. I couldn't believe it. I went into instant shock. It's the most horrible experience that anybody could ever go through. She tells investigators about her son's short and troubled life. A difficult journey that began when Chad was born three and a half months premature. He was born two pounds, three ounces. He spent 121 days in the hospital fighting to live. And um, I was told that he was going to have all kinds of difficulties, but he grew up a fine, tall, good looking man an opinion shared by neighbor Aaron Lind. Chad was amazing, you know, he was a typical kid. Yeah, he got into trouble here and there a little bit. Nothing, you know, too much out of the ordinary of anyone else his age. Uh, he was um, very, very loyal. He'd give you the shirt off his back if he thought you needed it. He, he loved people. He loved all kinds of people. He just, he was a kind person. Sometimes I would get angry with him because he was just a bit too kind, you know? But there was another side to Chad Larkey. Looking at his background, um, he's got a couple of confrontational issues regarding drugs. Bar fights, uh, he'd had a domestic with his parents. You could definitely see his behavior kind of ramping up over the past, uh, the most recent couple of years. But what could possibly motivate someone to so brutally murder and mutilate this young man? It's a very violent, uh, very deliberate uh, act. And in our forensic unit, we always say anyone is capable of homicide. Uh, but it's a totally different level when someone is capable of dismemberment. And as the lead forensic officer on the case, Anderson hopes that the savage killer has left behind a clue. As a proper protocol, we use tape to make sure that we caught all of the uh, potential trace evidence, such as fibers or hair, and ensure that if there's something there, we will find it. Meanwhile, police release a statement about the Largy killing. All we ever told the community and, and the media was that we had one arm that was located. By not revealing the discovery of the second arm to the public, 
police create what's called holdback information, crucial details about the murder that only the killer could know. The news of Chad Largie's gruesome murder sets the entire city on edge. Calgary Police Staff Sergeant Patty McCallum. There's shock because it's dismemberment and people become afraid that maybe somebody's out there that they too could be the next target who would be dismembered. Investigators have learned from Chad's mother that he had spent the evening of the murder at a Calgary bar. We were able to get Chad's cell phone records by a search warrant. It confirmed the fact that he'd been in the downtown area um, prior to the homicide. We know that uh, he had been drinking, and we were able to establish that Chad had phoned uh, for somebody to come and pick him up. And we actually have the last known video of Chad leaving that bar. Chad's phone call was to his father, James Largy. Police contact him. Chad's father really did not want to come and talk to us. He didn't want to know any details about his son's death. Um, this is very strange. Um, I don't know any parent that wouldn't want to know the details and to assist in the investigation. It is only when police threaten James Largy with arrest that he agrees to speak with them. And on Saturday morning, 24 hours after the discovery of his son's remains, he sits down for an interview with investigators. He tells them that Chad phoned him because he was stranded at the bar and that Largy was taking his son home when Chad decided to visit friend Dean Commanda. Dean comes down, meets him at the back of the apartment building. They give Chad's dad some money to go buy some mix. Chad's father comes back a short time later with the mix, can't get into the apartment, makes some phone calls, and ultimately goes home. But is James Largy telling the truth? Or was this young man murdered, then brutally dismembered by his own father? There's no doubt um, that we suspected uh, Chad's father may have had something to do with it. We followed up James Largy's story, saying that he had gone out for mix. We went and obtained the video to make sure that that's where he was. His story checks out. James Largy is innocent. And investigators are back to square one. When Calgary police are called to the scene of a dumpster containing a dismembered arm, investigators must determine the identity of the victim and the motive for the murder. Is this uh, some type of uh, organized crime group that is sending a message or trying to get revenge on somebody? Police soon discover a second arm, and lead forensic investigator Jolaine Anderson begins the grisly job of searching for clues. When we tape the arms, we're believing that the offender has left something behind on the arms, whether it be hair, fiber, potentially. Chad Largy had spent the evening of his murder at a Calgary bar, then called his dad to pick him up. Police contact James Largy, who reacts with indifference to his son's death and refuses to cooperate with them. There's no doubt Chad's father was, was absolutely a person of interest for us. But the father's story about having dropped off Chad at friend Dean Commanda's turns out to be true. And it is by no means the first time police have heard the name Dean Commanda. Commanda had been known to us for a long time. He had a known criminal history. He had a known drug-related history. But could the 22-year-old have actually had a hand in the killing and savage mutilation of his best friend? There is nothing in their past that would indicate that Commando would have killed Larry. Nor, according to Commando's girlfriend, did Dean have the opportunity. She says he was with her the night Chad was murdered. What's more, Commando seemed genuinely worried when Largy dropped out of sight. 
We were able to uh, get access to Chad's cell phone, and uh, Dean had left several voicemails for Chad after the murder. Back at the Calgary Police Forensic Lab, Sergeant Jolaine Anderson has come to a gruesome conclusion about Chad Largie's dismembered limbs and the person who committed the savage act. He uh, certainly changed the method with which he uh, dismembered the first arm compared to the second arm. The first had been sawed off. I imagine it took uh, a significant amount of time and force to uh, dismember the, the first arm. By the time he got to the second arm, the murderer had the hang of it. Essentially uh, cutting the tendons and the muscle and pulling the arm out of its socket. As you can well imagine, it, it would have to have been very violent. This ghastly evidence tells investigators that Chad Largie's dismemberment was not the work of a seasoned killer, but of a novice unaccustomed to such a horrific act. In their appeal to the public for tips, police intentionally do not release information about the discovery of the second arm. When we found uh, both arms in the dumpster, we kept that as holdback. Important details only the killer would know. Police are inundated with calls from shocked Calgarians. One of the tips is from a rental company. They rented out a meat cutter, and the person that returned the meat cutter after having it for the weekend um, left it full of flesh and full of blood. Could those remains be Chad Largies? I was tasked then to follow up with the owner of the business, find out who had rented it, and make contact and interview the people who were involved. Blood analysis reveals that the remains are not the victims, but that of a slaughtered animal. And the person who had rented the meat cutter was a butcher who had neglected to clean it before returning it. Now investigators have received a report about a woman who claims to know a great deal about Chad Largie's murder. If true, it could provide them with a crucial break in the case. My partner and I went and met with her and interviewed her, and she tells us that she was there when it took place, she witnessed it, and she provides a lot of details. But she seems unaware that two arms have been discarded in the dumpster, proving to police that, despite her story, the woman was not a witness to the murder. We were able to determine that she was just bragging for the sake of uh, br bravado, really. So that kind of thing is very, very frustrating in these investigations. We don't have time to be chasing down these false leads. We have to identify a suspect. We need to identify, in this case, a scene so that we can go there and get our people in. Forensics do deteriorate over time. So we need to get there as quick as we can. Investigators in the murder of Chad Largy have come to believe that his death and grisly dismemberment was the work of an amateur. It was pretty clear that one arm had been uh, pulled out of the joint. The other arm had been sawed off. Police are motivated to find answers for the victim's mother. I needed to know that he was not alive when they cut him up. Investigators have determined that the last person to see victim Chad Largie alive was 22-year-old Dean Commanda. Commanda and Largie were friends, and there is nothing in their past that would indicate that Commanda would have killed Largie. Meanwhile, police lose valuable time in the hunt for Largie's murderer on dead-end leads and false confessions. We don't have time to be chasing down these false leads. That kind of thing is very, very frustrating in these investigations. Then O'Brien gets a call from a rancher who thinks a burn site on his property just outside of Calgary could relate to the case. It had some knives burnt in this site. I thought, what are the chances of that? I mean, that didn't make a lot of sense to me, but you never know. 
To be certain, O'Brien sends a team to check it out. When our uh, crime scenes unit gets out to the scene, it's an open area, it's very windy. Most of the ash from the burn site has actually already blown away. On the scene, lead forensic investigator Jolaine Anderson. In there we found uh, cutlery, burnt cutlery, burnt uh, cookware. Including a collection of charred knives. And the torch site reveals other details. The scene was in January, so it was uh, somewhat cool. Uh, there was light snow on the ground, so we were still able to recover tire impressions as well as footwear impressions. All of which could be invaluable if the burn site has anything to do with Chad Largie's murder. But there is nothing at the scene to suggest that it does. Suddenly, something catches Anderson's observant eye. Other officers were uh, uh, photographing and seizing as they do, and uh, overall, I was standing back uh, watching, and I saw a, a receipt uh, kind of blow by in the wind. I picked it up and had a look at it and thought, this is very odd. It is a receipt from a 7-Eleven store from two weeks before. But how could a random receipt connect this burn site to their case? I then followed up that receipt to a 7-Eleven. Then going through with the timestamp, I was able to get video evidence of the suspect buying minutes for his phone. And the man who purchased those minutes is Dean Commanda, Chad Largie's closest friend, and the last person to see him alive. Right around that same time, some of the detectives working on the case uh, did some uh, computer checks on our database, and they found that Dean Commander had rented a uh, rental truck, which had dual tires. The same kind of tires that made the marks in the snow at the Springbank burn site. That's when police are shocked to discover that rental truck had been lit on fire. Although that fire had extinguished itself, uh, there had been an attempt to destroy this truck. Fortunately for investigators, the cab of the truck was relatively intact. So we were able to find a pair of uh, loafer-type shoes uh, that were in there. Those shoes match up with uh, footwear impressions that we find out at the Springbank burn site. A further search of the truck turns up what could be another important clue. Beside the driver's seat, we also find a label for a jerry can. It became my task then to take that label and find out the origins. And I went to the Canadian Tire, which then suggested that that particular SKU number would go to a petrocan. And then you take the time period, which leads us to video evidence, which they had in their petrocan store. What the video shows fascinates police. We have Dean Commander going to a gas station on the western edge of our city, buying a jerry can, buying some gas. We have household items being burnt in Springbank in the western part of our city. We have the uh, truck that Dean had rented um, burnt. Uh, again, an arson about a block from where it should be returned to. Which might link Dean Commander to the burn site and burned out truck. But so far, there is nothing that connects him to Chad Largie's murder and brutal dismemberment. That's when investigators spot a strange bit of coiled wire amongst the burn site debris. We weren't sure what it was until you take a closer look at it. And what it is is a, is a coiled door stop. So why would a remnant of household hardware be of interest to homicide investigators? Somebody was cleaning up and somebody had thrown out pieces of baseboard, which would include this coil door stop. He has an idea about who that somebody is. Dean Commander, 
and O'Brien believes Commando was cleaning up Chad Largie's blood, then trying to destroy the evidence. So now what I need to do is to work on a search warrant to get into Dean's apartment where we believe is where the crime was committed. Forensics do deteriorate over time, and so we need to get there as quick as we can. It has been more than a week since the discovery of Chad Largie's arms in a Calgary dumpster, but police have yet to find the rest of his body or identify his savage killer. Despite investigators' belief that a burn site on the outskirts of Calgary has nothing to do with their case, they send a team to check it out. They find charred cookware and cutlery, including a collection of knives, and lead forensic investigator Jolaine Anderson spots a receipt. It was blowing along the, uh, the prairie, and uh, I'd stepped on it, picked it up, and uh, realized that this was, uh, in fact, potential key evidence. Officers trace it to a convenience store and pull the surveillance video. And sure enough, we have Dean Commanda going into that particular 7-Eleven store and purchasing some minutes for his cell phone. Meanwhile, police discover that Commanda had recently rented a vehicle with the same dual tire marks found at the scene of the burn site. Although the truck has been torched, investigators are able to retrieve a pair of shoes from the cab. There was a very clear characteristic that we found uh, on the footwear, and we were able to do a comparative chart uh, with the one footwear impression that we found at scene. They also pull from the truck a jerry can. Police trace it to a gas station, and surveillance video shows Commanda purchasing the can and then filling it with fuel. But the evidence indicates only that Dean Commanda may be responsible for the arsons. It's not until investigators discover a doorstop at the burn site that they begin to believe that Commander may have killed and dismembered Chad Largy in his condo, then ripped out and set ablaze any trace of the crime. Really, Dean is now, no doubt about it, has become our, our number one suspect in this case. Police apply for a warrant to enter Commander's apartment, although they know it will take days to process their request. In the meantime, having discovered that Commander's car is nowhere to be found, they get a search underway for it. We felt that because it had gone missing, that it may have some information that may be related to the case. Detective O'Brien had me put together a bulletin. It was sent out to our district offices, our traffic unit. It was sent out to our partner agencies around Southern Alberta to see if anyone could locate this vehicle. Within hours of us putting that out and within hours of us talking to the media about it, I received a call from an RCMP officer who said that she had found a, a vehicle and it had been at the side of the road on fire. The license plate was missing, the VIN number was missing, and it matched the offender's vehicle. So again, we have another link to Dean here and, and torching of his car. Why would Dean Commanda have set his own car on fire? Did it contain something he was trying to destroy? Cliff O'Brien tries repeatedly to contact Commander. I am phoning him relentlessly to come in and talk to me. And I am leaving him voicemails. And uh, I am phoning his friends. I'm going to his house. I'm leaving my business card. So he now knows that he needs to come talk to me. But when Commander ignores investigators' calls, they park a surveillance team outside his residence. Then O'Brien calls to tell Commander the jig is up. Within an hour of that phone call and me leaving that voicemail for him, Dean and his girlfriend come screaming out of the residence, get into a car and drive very, very quickly, very erratically to uh, a local hospital. Our surveillance team goes into the hospital and can see Dean being wheeled into uh, emergency with some type of bandage on his hand, and uh, Dean is screaming. And investigators think they know how their suspect injured himself. During the attack on Chad, and during Chad's murder, that Dean cut his hand, likely from the knife slipping. 
So why was Commander admitted to the hospital not for a knife wound, but a third degree burn on the palm of his hand? Police have a theory. But when he knew that we were coming for him, he put on a frying pan onto his stove and he put his cut hand right onto the frying pan to cover up the fact that he had this knife wound. And with his girlfriend clearly involved in the ruse, Dean Commander's alibi for the night of the murder goes out the window. It is the behavior of a desperate man. He's burning his own hand, he's burning property. He's taking all these large steps to conceal evidence, but in retrospect, what he's doing is pointing right at him. But investigators still don't have enough of a case against Commander to arrest him, and their warrant to search his apartment has yet to come through. Police decide to keep a team on Commander's tail. Dean and his girlfriend go to a movie theater. So I asked our surveillance people to go in and to see if there was any cast off DNA. Our surveillance unit was able to seize a straw that Dean had been using. And we were able to send that to the crime lab and get uh, Dean's DNA off of that straw. Then on January 30th, investigators are finally granted the warrant to search Commander's residence. This has taken us uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 days. So I'm very, very worried that maybe uh, Commanda has cleaned up the apartment so well that our crime scenes people will have difficulty finding evidence. When police discover Dean Commanda's burnt out car, they suspect it contained incriminating evidence, perhaps the blood of murder victim and close friend Chad Largy. Then the 22-year-old commando badly burns his own hand with a frying pan, and police believe he's trying to hide the knife wound he received struggling with Chad. The burns obliterate what we suspected was uh, a cut from uh, a knife fight. Police put a surveillance team on commando, follow him to a movie theater, then lift his DNA from a discarded drinking straw. It's not until 10 days after Largi's death and gruesome dismemberment that police are granted the warrant to search the site that they believe to be the scene of the crime, the suspect's condo. That's allowed Commander a lot of time to destroy evidence. Lead forensic investigator Jolaine Anderson will have her job cut out for her. When the door opens to the, uh, the apartment-style condo, uh, immediately we see that uh, there's uh, carpets been removed, underlays been removed, and the condo is in somewhat disarray. I can see that baseboards are missing. I can see lots of cleaning supplies around. It's very, very evident to me, just standing in the hallway, looking in, that there had been a substantial amount of cleanup. Anderson records video evidence of the crime scene and considers where to best concentrate her search. Just by looking at the pattern with which the carpet and the baseboards were removed, uh, the scene of the homicide would have been just outside the bathroom in that the hallway area, and uh, probably the dismemberment uh, in the bathtub bathroom area. First thing that we did was a basic white light exam. Pure white light um, in a slow, methodical method will give you um, lots of information. We would go through the different wavelengths of light uh, with different types of filters on our uh, eyes to protect our eyes, as well as filters on the camera so we can capture what we're seeing, so we can present it later in court. While forensics officers examine every inch of the bathroom, in the kitchen, they discover bloody bandages in the garbage. So, which of course is very unusual because it's a homicide scene. Obviously, it wouldn't have helped the victim to have a bandage. Police compare DNA from the blood to the DNA found on Commander's drinking straw. It's Dean's profile, so it's Dean's blood. Evidence of the wound he received during the attack on Chad Larkey. But without proof of Commander having murdered Largy, 
their case against him is largely circumstantial. It is a difficult thing to sit there and wait for the updates from crime scenes. And I am on pins and needles waiting to see if we have the evidence that we need. Anderson's painstaking process pays off. We uh, found the uh, blood stain on the back of the toilet in the bathroom. Clearly a place that Dean forgot to clean. Uh, I was very, very excited. The CSI programs is somewhat glamorous and somewhat glorified. This was far from that. Uh, we were crawling behind someone's toilet and looking for uh, forensic evidence. But does the blood belong to Chad Larkey? If so, investigators will finally have the evidence they'll need to convict Commander for the murder and brutal dismemberment of his best friend. While they wait for DNA results, forensics officers continue to search Commander's apartment. And in a box of clothes, find a stained pair of jeans. Is it blood? We used a little test strip uh, where we would uh, use distilled water and uh, introduce the blood or the evidence that we found to it. If it turns a, a greeny blue, then that's a positive presumptive test for blood. They quickly confirm that the blood found in the bathroom and on the clothing is Chad Larkey's. Finding the blood on Commander's jeans was, was crucial to us. It, uh, it told us, uh, you know, what Dean was wearing at the time. Police apprehend both Commander and his girlfriend at a Calgary bar. She is held for having provided the suspect with a false alibi. He is charged with second degree murder. After an intensive 10-day search for the ruthless killer of 22-year-old Chad Largy, Dean Commanda is finally behind bars. Blood spatters found in the bathroom confirm the location of Largy's grisly dismemberment. And bandages covered with Commanda's blood clearly place him at the scene of his best friend's horrendous murder. first time I met Dean Commanda, I told Chad that he would be the death of him. And those were my exact words, that Chad, he's going to be the death of you. But will the killer confess to his crime? And will he reveal what he did with the rest of Chad Largy's butchered body? I had some of our best interviewers conduct the interview with Dean and I monitored uh, from another room Dean said nothing and this was a long interview I had been keeping uh, Chad's mom Lorraine updated as to the status of the interview she asks for the chance to speak with Commander face to face I've never done this before and I've never done it since but I drove out I picked up the victim's mom, Lorraine, and we drove down to headquarters where I allowed Lorraine and Chad's sister to go in and see if they could talk to Dean and at the very least try to figure out where the rest of Chad's remains were. Police record their conversation. I just kept on saying, please, you know, just tell me where his parts are so we can put them together and, and I can have a proper burial. That's all I'm asking you. That was probably the most intense thing I've seen in one of our interview rooms where we have a grieving mother pleading with her son's killer, who she knows, to give her son a proper burial. It was, uh, it was heart-wrenching. I need to know what happened because I'm gonna die if I don't know what happened. Dave, please. <laughs> my boy. Despite the
the mother's pleas, Dean Commander refuses to confess to what he did with the rest of Chad Largy's body, nor will he reveal why he murdered him. Dean had no soul. He, he was empty. His eyes were empty. You know, at the end of these cases, sometimes we just don't have all the answers because the only person that knows is Dean, and he's not talking. Investigators suspect that Commander left Chad Largy stranded at the bar. Then Largy had his father take him to Commander's so he could have it out with him. The two fought, and Dean Commander stabbed his friend to death, then butchered him to get rid of the body. After using his car to distribute Largy's body parts in dumpsters around the city, Commander set the vehicle on fire to destroy any evidence left inside. Then he tore apart his condo to get rid of the enormous amount of blood, loaded the materials into a rental vehicle, and drove them to the outskirts of Calgary. After torching the garbage at the Springbank site, Commander returned to town and set the rental truck on fire in order to destroy any DNA and to try to cover his tracks. Lead forensic investigator Jolaine Anderson is proud of the work she and her team contributed to the investigation. This truly was a forensic uh, case file. And just for us to be able to link all of these very diverse scenes, um, everything from the West outdoor burn scene in Springbank to the uh, condo, to the U-Haul, everything fell into place almost systematically. In court, Commander maintains that Chad Larkey was the aggressor and that he killed his friend in self-defense. And on February 13th, 2007, a little more than a year since Chad Largy's gruesome death, Dean Commander pleads guilty to manslaughter. He is sentenced to 10 years less time already served. Commander's girlfriend is not charged. Chad Largy's remains have never been found. In 2009, Sergeant Jolaine Anderson was promoted to the rank of Staff Sergeant and is now in charge of Calgary's Forensic Crime Scene Unit.